I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love, um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat. We drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate, sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco and every time I come back here I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Good evening and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Kishore Hari. I work on the science policy team at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, but tonight we're putting science aside. Uh, for a really fun discussion, um, because from ridiculous amounts of pudding to way too short shorts uh, to inviting us all to be amazing, uh, Michael Ian Black has taken us on unexpected journeys. Uh, comedian, author, actor, interviewer, doesn't come close to describing uh, it all. And tonight we discuss maybe his most vulnerable and challenging role, that of a dad. Uh, he's the author of A Better Man, A Mostly Serious Letter to My Son. Uh, if you would like to ask Michael a question, please do so in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. Uh, but without further ado, let's get started. Michael, welcome to Inforum. Well, thank you, Kishore. Kishore, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, the accent goes up for sure. Uh, at the end. I, I just want to note that um, in that intro video, which is brings back a ton of memories because I was at a number of events, Mary Roach holds up what she describes as an anthropology scarf, uh, but that's actually a small intestine. Um, and that used to sit under my desk at UCSF. And it was kind of cool to see her, see that uh, intestine get its due in front of I of have thousands. to tell you, 
I was getting uh, surprisingly kind of uh, emotional watching that video. And I don't have a strong association with the Commonwealth Club by any means, but it was just the images of people together doing stuff uh, fairly intimately. And I realized just for a moment, oh yeah, I really missed that. Uh, yeah, I feel that way seeing you here in my screen and not not for the reason um you know people might expect it's that i usually see you once a year and i see you once a year at sf sketch fest i'm so used to seeing you perform um at our comedy festival which you know for my money is the best comedy festival going um and seeing you in front of crowds doing you know zany things from like discussing uh, there was a reunion of the state. I remember seeing there was one time that uh, I saw you at a show at the punchline and you were walking out the door for a Douglas movies taping and they had to bring you back. And you're like, I had no idea I was in this show. And you just went on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Uh, yeah. If, if, if your audience don't, doesn't know it, the San Francisco sketch fest year in and year out is the best comedy festival in, uh, in the U S to, to, uh, for my money. And uh, yeah. And that's another thing I'm missing. Uh, as we head into San Francisco Sketch Fest season. Uh, yeah, so yeah, but but tonight we're here to talk about something different with you, which is uh, your book. And I think if people aren't familiar with your uh, your interview podcast or some of the writings that you've done, they might be caught a little off guard uh, in terms of, of seeing who your roles on TV to what this book is, which is a treatise on on uh, being a dad and a, and a love letter to your son. Yeah, I mean, I, I purposely subtitled it a mostly serious letter to my son because it is indeed mostly serious. I'll read a little bit of it for you just to give you a sense of the tone. It's not all serious, but it's, it's mostly serious. So it's addressed to my son, Elijah. Um, he... I, I wrote this when he was in his senior year of high school. He has since graduated. He's now home again because of COVID and, and the college situation, uh, but he will be returning to college at some point, I hope. So this is chapter two. It's entitled Rosary. The subtitle of the chapter is Tell Your Kids You Love Them. One of my favorite photos of my dad, your grandpa, is also one of the last he ever took. He's 39. In the photo, Dad wears a slight, embarrassed smile below the goofy teddy bear baseball cap his wife Beth had given him to cover the new scar that stretches across his skull. He'd undergone emergency brain surgery a couple months before, after the police found him slumped over in his car, unconscious. In assault, they thought, maybe a mugging gone bad they didn't know. My mom told us about it the following morning. He was gonna be okay, she said. And I remember thinking something like, of course he's gonna be okay. I'd never considered that my father could be hurt, let alone die. A few days later, your uncle Eric and I went to see him at the hospital. I remember him in bed, head shaved and bandaged, sleepy and frail, his body covered in a loose gown. I felt awkward and unsure and scared. His fragility frightened me more than anything else. He'd never been a big guy, but every father is a giant to his son, although less so when his son overtakes him in height, as you, annoyingly, have done to me. We stayed with him for an hour or so that day, but he didn't talk much, and when we left him, I felt relieved. When Dad came home, he was weak and unsure on his feet. That Christmas, Beth gave him teddy bears, Lots of teddy bears, big and small. One of the bears was sewn to the brim of a baseball cap, the dumb hat in the photo. A few months later, he would be back in the hospital where he died from a blood clot. I remember that tight smile of his. It was his all purpose smile. It could mean joy, sorrow, frustration, bafflement, or some combination of those. It's a smile unwilling to commit to emotion. Every now and again, I catch myself making that same smile and I get a tingle of deja vu. It's funny, I look more like my mom. I have her coloring and some of her facial features, but I have never felt possessed by her in the same way I do when I discover my dead father's expression 
on my face. Uh, I, I'm going to try not to cry too much tonight, but I'm making no promises. Um, uh, let's start by talking about your dad. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I want to point out, like, there's this sign on the wall next to me, and it says science has no borders. It's a, it's a sign my dad held up uh, when I organized the March for Science a couple years ago. And uh, he held it behind me as he, uh, as he spoke, as I spoke about our immigrant family and science enabling us to, to come to this country. And um, like my dad has a, a degenerative lung condition. And so uh, he's pretty frail. He probably has like a year left to live and I can't see him now. Um, I like uh, our final chats are seem to be over uh, over FaceTime and Zoom. And I, I was struck by this point in the book uh, soon thereafter that passage where you talk about the number of photos you have of your dad and how few of them um, there are. Uh, and, um, you know, I just found myself sort of breaking down because like I see the frailness of my dad that you describe in that package, in, the, in that passage. Um, and as you're reflecting on writing to your son, um, what what did it mean to look back and and talk about a, a father that you didn't necessarily have the longest relationship with? I didn't. And obviously, like through the course of my life, um, he he was 12 when I died. I have never really stopped thinking about him um, or my relationship to him. What I wish the relationship could have been and where I felt like it was heading. My, my dad was very, um, not non-communicative, but wasn't the most communicative guy, particularly with children. He had a hard time really identifying with kids. He was a soft-spoken and gentle guy. Um, he was definitely a product of his time. He grew up in Queens in the 50s and 60s. And um, all of that came through, particularly in his dealings with the three children. I have an older brother and a younger sister named Susan who has Down syndrome, which presented its own challenges. Um, this book in particular caused me to really reflect naturally on his parenting, uh, my own parenting. And in a lot of ways, although this is a letter written to my son, I also feel like it's a letter written to my dad um, things I wish he had said to me, things I wish I could say to him, questions that I have, and, you know, the gnawing hollowness that I think anybody who loses a parent young must feel, um, because there is a space in you that will always be unfulfilled. Yeah, as I was reading this, and I was so struck at, at the the kind of vulnerability that you showed in writing this letter. And it is very apparent that you weren't just writing this to your son, that it, it was something for yourself and your, your father and even your grandfather to a certain extent um, uh, and your wife and all just a, a huge My daughter of people. Too. Yeah. Um, it was, I was, I was in that mode of thinking about my father. And my father came from not a dissimilar generation than the father that you talked about. They didn't talk about the things that are in this book. Uh, my father's whole uh, modus uh, operandi of coming to this country was, I have to get out of India to come to this country to uh, build a life. So I have to put my head down and not talk about everything else and just work hard so my family can thrive. Uh, and there are some similarities both in how you, in how I describe that to how you describe um, the situation with your father and to a, to a lesser extent with your grandfather as well. Uh, do you think it would have been possible for people uh, in your father's generation and my father's generation to write something like this? Sure, I, I do. I mean, in my father's generation, certainly, because my dad was you know, he, he definitely was coming of age as a, as a adult man in the sixties. Uh, he and my mom married in 1969. It would have been, yeah, eminently possible for him to have embraced the changes that were going on in the culture. As it happens, the changes arrived at his front door um, when my mom started sleeping with the neighbor lady. 
uh, and came out as a lesbian and divorced my father. I mean, that was a revolutionary act in our household and, you know, indicative of the revolution that was going on in the country as a whole. So I don't know if my dad was actively fighting the culture. He wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't counter countercultural. Um, but I think he was just kind of removed from it. I think he was uncomfortable doing uncomfortable things. Um, and then he was forced to, he was forced to deal with it. Yeah. I think there's like a certain level of emotion that you talk about in this book. Like I, I've seen my dad cry twice uh, in my life and they were um, intense uh, moments that I, I, I don't necessarily want to recall. They, it was not something that was necessarily available, uh, but you talk about uh, emotion um, in the context of your son and showing that vulnerability throughout this book uh, of wanting to show that. Um, in, as much as I, I understand what you're saying about like, maybe he had the capacity to write this, there still seems to be a, like a difference in what you sort of took on here um, versus what was um, sort of modeled. Um, by oh, the, oh yeah, no, I just mean theoretically, generationally, yes, it could have happened from a personality <laughs> point of view. No, it couldn't have happened. Um, and I will say, I talk about emotional availability and vulnerability a lot in this book. Um, and I want to be clear, I have a hard time taking my own advice, embracing my own words. I'm still very much a product of the culture. And it's a culture that is certainly more progressive than my father's culture, at least, you know, where I grew up and, and in the situation that I grew up. But um, those, you know, has my son seen me cry? I'm not sure he has. Um, I talk about when my mom died a few years ago, three years ago now, and how I really wanted to be present in the mourning process for her. And I couldn't get there, you know, during the three days of Shiva and the memorial and all of that. And it really, and it really wasn't until I was alone in my hotel room and drinking, which I rarely do, that I kind of uncorked myself. Um, and I hated that. I hated that I, 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 it's not that I wanted to be emotive. It's not that I wanted to do sort of performative gnashing of teeth or anything. It's that I wanted to just be in touch with whatever was happening and whatever was happening to me still felt inaccessible. It's still, I still felt, felt numb, which maybe just is what was going on. You know, the, the early part of the book that really resonated with me was you were talking about being on one of those VH1 recap shows, like I love the eighties or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you talked about like this kind of perfected deadpan sarcastic way that you had and how you use that to hide like the, just the anger that was kind of seething beneath the surface, um, which describes basically how I developed a sense of humor uh, yeah. like going back to the high school, like I used it as a defense mechanism. Can you talk about um, uh, that? Because it struck me as, again, like not a dissimilar thing than what you were just talking about with grief uh, of having access to those emotions. My own experience is similar to yours. I mean, I developed a sense of humor to, you know, as a defense mechanism. I wasn't a big kid. I was young for my grade. I had skipped a grade and I was already on the young side. So all the boys were much bigger than me. Um, and you know, I wasn't, I wasn't like them in a lot of ways. I mean, I wasn't a jock, which, you know, was really rewarded in my New Jersey 1980s upbringing. Um, I wanted to be an actor. Like nobody wanted to be an actor. Like, what, what is that? Like, that's just nonsensical where I came from. Um, you know, and, and the way I spoke and the way I carried myself, you know, it was easy to, to pigeonhole me as gay, as whatever, you know, gay was the kind of all purpose insult in the eighties. Um, but it, it could literally mean gay or it could just mean something other than. And so I developed a sense of humor. Um, 
But my story and your story and what I think so many men go through is indicative of what I think of as the two sort of acceptable emotional responses for guys, which are anger or withdrawal. And that sense of humor is really, it's a way of withdrawing. It's a way of detaching yourself from the world and you know, sort of throwing the world back at whatever target you're intending. And I made a lot of money doing that. Like I started to make a pretty good living being withdrawn and sarcastic and deadpan and dry. And um, I got quite good at it, I think. But what ended up happening is that it began to feel more and more like a prison because it was no longer reflective of who I was or who I wanted to be more, more especially because I was married. My wife was pregnant with our son and it just felt like I was building these walls around myself that were getting harder and harder to escape from. And so I made a really conscious decision to stop um, knowing that that could have negative repercussions for me professionally. And in fact it has, um, but also knowing that it was worth it to me because I couldn't, I couldn't live like that. Yeah. I, I um, recall in my twenties, I was living in San Francisco at the time. Like uh, I had used it to that sarcasm to great effect. And I, you know, I like, I had a career and everything else, but I was wickedly unhappy. Um, and I joined a men's group which I was, I, I had judgments in my own head of joining a group of men to discuss our feelings and like uh, make time to actually um, uh, express ourselves. And we'd go out to like the the beach on cold nights and, and kind of talk about stuff and experience like our emotions. And I, I remember it, that changed my life in the sense of like, I was able to like enter a relationship after that in a real whose, way. Whose idea was it for you to join a men's group? Did you seek that out? Um, I had friends that like knew that I was unhappy and they had some experience going to one of these things. And so somebody like helped me. Um, was was, was any part of you worried that it was a cult? Oh, hundred percent still to this day a little bit too. <laughs> like if I, if I'm being like honest about it, like it's a really weird time, but um, you know, I think there is this like incredibly vulnerable time for many um, boys and men through that period of adolescence to early adulthood um, that you touch on throughout this book of where they are vulnerable to the um, to modes of operation. And we're seeing the consequences of that in society writ large right now. We see them uh, constantly. And I would say not just for... Uh, teenagers and young men, my dogs are barking because my son, I think, just came home from work. Uh, we're seeing it not just in adolescents and young men, we see it uh, carry forward throughout men's lives um, because I think a lot of men are afraid to do the kind of introspection that you did um, in your early 20s because it, it, it dredges up a lot of pain for, for guys, a lot of... Um, emotions that maybe are easier left not dealt with. Um, you know, I made a joke about, you know, are you sure it wasn't a cult? Because the idea of a men's group is still so alien in our culture because there isn't, there aren't sort of sanctioned spaces really for men to have those kinds of conversations that don't exist outside of like church groups, you know, and Bible study or um, under the guise of like recovery. Um, but just like healthy spaces for guys to talk to each other, that's a very rare occurrence. And so, you know, my thinking naturally goes to, well, what's the ulterior motive there? And what you're saying, fortunately, is <laughs> there was none. Uh, but, like, like, maybe, I mean, there was a- Pretty alien. It totally felt alien, it still does to this day. And like, um, you know, no group, that uh, has that kind of intensity doesn't have some similarity to a cult somewhere along the line. But uh, so that's why I laughed and made the joke back because there's some truth in it. Um, but that's Most not guys just doing CrossFit and that's sort of their men's group at this no, point. No, 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 no. I like ice cream too much uh, for that <laughs> nonsense. Um, the, uh, the thing that, uh, uh, that you bring up early in the book and themes throughout 
um, are these places where we don't, when we don't create those spaces, what the ramifications are. And you start the book very explicitly talking about Sandy Hook, which is, you know, you're you're calling us from from Connecticut, and it it obviously had a massive impact on you. It had a a massive impact on my life as my wife grew up in a town called Monroe, just a um, a stone's throw away from Newtown. Um, and talk about why why Sandy Hook had that impact on you and how it impacted your relationship with your son. There were a couple things in particular that I think would naturally impact anybody. First of all, uh, the town that I live in, like Monroe, is maybe half a dozen miles from that elementary school. My kids were in elementary school at that time, on that day. Um, and I describe the event as feeling very much like a tornado touching down in our community. Um, and what was particularly infuriating about it was that like a tornado, we knew it would happen. We didn't know where a tornado would touch down. I wasn't expecting it to touch down in my community, but we've seen these events play out time and time and time again. And so when it finally comes to your community, when it came to my community, I felt the obvious horror, the obvious rage, the obvious shock, and also a sense of despair at my own inability as a father to protect my kids. And maybe that was the first time because they were still young that I felt like there's only so much any of us can do as parents to keep our children safe. Um, even in the best of circumstances, your children are gonna necessarily lead lives that are further from your arm's reach. And your limits as a parent and as a father and as a man are therefore present. You know, you, you, you start to understand those boundaries of what you can control and what you can't. And it arrived with a kind of sudden and terrifying force on that day when we were watching the news and receiving calls from the school saying they were in lockdown and please don't come to get your children and we will send them home at the regular time and it's up to you to tell them how you want to tell them, we won't be telling them anything and having to explain to them what happened. It was, it was a powerful moment. Yeah, I I remember going my to my son's back to school night. My son's nine, and so obviously Sandy Hook happened, um, you know, before he was in school. But uh, there's been so many mass shootings since then. Um, I've sadly had numerous occasion to talk to him about this. But we went to his back to school night, and they had done this project with these Tibetan prayer flags, where they made these beautiful designs, and you were to put a prayer on it. Um, that you wanted for, I think it was either like the people of San Francisco or just for humanity itself. And he wrote, um, I, um, I want uh, people not to use guns on each other. And it was in this like kind of innocent second grade kind of way. And it broke my heart um, uh, to see him process that. Um, but I leveraged that. I used that to actually get him into activism. This is his first March. I don't know if you can see. Um, this was at the March for Our Lives, and he made his own protest sign while I made one that said uh, more science, less violence. Um, he made one that said baseball, not guns, which has been his <laughs> unofficial motto now through life. Um, it it kind of uh, I bring it up because it struck me is like is the the kid that he is. And while he's not um, a white kid, a disaffected male it are often the perpetrators of these um, uh, of these mass shootings. And you do not shy away from making that link in the book and how there is a level of masculinity and um, and kind of isolation that seems to be in common with those with people that uh, participate in this. And and I want to acknowledge you you make it clear that you're not approaching this as an expert or a psychologist when you make that link. You're just making an observation as a dad. The, the event that immediately preceded or precipitated this book was the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. 
um, years after Sandy Hook when, again, it was a mass shooting in a school, this time a high school. My kids were in high school at this point. I had been very vocal uh, since Sandy Hook, basically, about the issue of gun violence. I had spent a lot of my time and energy blaming the NRA and blaming gun manufacturers and blaming legislators for not acting. Um, And when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas happened, I just asked the obvious question, why is it boys always who are pulling the triggers, almost always who are pulling the triggers? It's almost always boys. And in the case of mass shootings, it's almost always white boys. Um, Why? I wrote a Twitter thread about it, just like, you know, an anguished Twitter thread. The New York Times saw that and asked me to write an op-ed, which I did. And then I got approached about writing a book on the subject. And I was initially very reluctant and I'm still reluctant to talk about this in a lot of ways because I'm not an academic. I'm not a sociologist or a historian or anything of the sort. I'm a C-list comedian um, who is also a dad. And I felt like if I have any qualification at all, it's that. I'm a father. I have whether I wanted to or not, thought about the issue of gender a lot over the last decades. Um, it has shown up in my stand-up comedy, especially without me really being aware of it. And I felt like there were things I, I could say on this subject, um, and in particular to my son. Uh- If you're just joining us, uh, you can place your questions in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. Um, If you don't know what this is, it's Michael Ian Black, the comedian, is offering a stranger an hour of therapy is what I think we've landed on at this point. Um, I I, want to draw a line into a phrase that's often used, which is toxic toxic masculinity, Mm -hmm. which is a a phrase that you outright reject as Mm -hmm. uh, being uh, as a label, um, uh, as uh, explanatory for for what we were just talking about in terms of 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 violence and and disaffected uh, young men. I reject it only because although I think men often display toxic behavior, we do. We just do. Um, because we have such a poor understanding and idea of what masculinity itself is, when the, that term toxic gets affixed to it, it creates a, a kind of a, a idea in, in, I think in the, in, the, in the popular imagination that all masculinity is toxic, if only because we don't understand what healthy masculinity is. So those toxic behaviors, which I fully acknowledge, Um, I think are byproducts of an anachronistic masculinity, um, which I sometimes call traditional masculinity. Um, But I don't reject traditional masculinity either because I think there's some wonderful things in it. Um, There's some wonderful male, you know, traditionally male attributes um, like strength and endurance and independence. Um, We those are traditionally male. We celebrate those in women now, in girls especially. We, we really venerate and, and, and talk a lot about strong women and independent women and fierce women um, because those are aspects of their humanity that were kind of closed off to them for generations. So I don't want to reject those attributes. Those are good attributes. Mm-hmm. They can become corrosive if they're taken too far, if your strength doesn't allow you to display any vulnerability, if your independence doesn't allow you to rely on other people or seek help from other people. So I try not to use the term toxic masculinity more because of an absence of a good definition of masculinity than because I think masculinity can't be toxic. Of course it can be. Yeah. I like what, what uh, kind of came through for me as I was reading that is like what your rejection is like the cartoonish displays of masculinity mm-hmm. that pervade uh, popular culture, um, uh, whether it's like being tough by making fun of other people or putting them down um, or carrying like a weapon to show that you're tough um, or calling people names like uh, you're uh, calling other people a sissy. So that that sort of lifts you up. Um, 
it, and it, it leads into this whole uh, area where you talk about like, what does it actually mean to be a man right now um, in today's culture? Uh, because those cartoonish displays, like I think um, reasonable um, uh, uh, men can point to them and like, that's that's not what I wanna be. Um, <laughs> but what what is the alternative? What is being a man in today's culture look like? It's a confusing time because men are presented with paradoxical messaging about what we should be and how we should be. On one hand, we are expected to be protectors and providers. We are expected to be the first one down the stairs when something goes bump in the night. We're expected to inhabit all of the traditional roles of masculinity and yet somehow also be sensitive, kind, caring, vulnerable partners and parents. That so I'm here to tell you that you can do something different because I think I have an agreement with my wife that she has who to, downstairs. Yeah. She's the first one downstairs. I have to take care of any spiders, but outside of that, <laughs> like she's, she's the one that's actually scary. I'm, I'm the one that like, <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, that's a, that's a good deal. I might take that deal in my house. Uh, Cause I could deal with the spiders. I think. Okay. And I could deal with the mice, but the intruders in the middle of the night that that's on her. Um, yeah. So sorry, I interrupted you. As all right. I, um, uh, I literally just picked a hangnail off my finger and ate it. Oh no my reason. God. So tough, Michael. So tough. So tough. I mean, um, super masculine and macho. Um, so, you know, we're presented with this kind of conundrum about who we're supposed to be. The way I think of it is like this. If the traditional role of the man is to provide and protect, and that is sort of traditionally who we are. I think we can still inhabit that, but we don't have to inhabit it alone. We are no longer the sole providers. We don't have to be. We are no longer the sole protectors. We don't have to be. Um, you may end up being the sole provider and protector in your household. Great, but you don't have to be. There's broader models of who we can be. Now, because women have sort of made great strides and inroads into those roles, provide and protect, a lot of guys, because they're worried about being seen as feminine or being seen as sissies, they've retreated into cartoonish variations of that, where they have to be the super provider and the super protector in order to sort of boost their own masculinity. And it's silly and it's anachronistic and it's a dead end road. And that's where I feel like the notions of like toxic masculinity really come to the fore is when you, when you feel as a guy that you're crowded into this corner of masculinity that you can't get out of. All I'm saying is you can, like you can, I think, I think of it pragmatically, you know, the, the economy today isn't about brawn anymore. It hasn't been for 50, 60 years, maybe more. The jobs that are coming along are about collaboration, or about um, uh, uh, using your brain instead of your muscles. And we need men who can work with other people and think with other people. Um, that's from a purely pragmatic point of view. From like a, from like a just a, a emotional and human point of view, I think the way to approach it is to think about um, if you're invested in traditional masculinity is to really consider how strong you have to be to be vulnerable. But there's a lot of strength that's required in saying to somebody, I'm hurt, I need help, I'm giving you my love, and even more challenging for I think a lot of guys, I'm accepting your love. Because in doing that, what you're doing is you're having to remove these prison walls that I constructed for myself, as I described earlier, and that I think a lot of guys um, construct for themselves because it feels safe in there, but it's, it's, you know, it's keeping you engaged. Yeah. The picture you paint is one of learning um, and exploration um, and uh, identification because we don't have these models um, in culture that are dominant right now for what masculinity can look like. Um, and it, it reminds me of, of a quote in the book um, that refers to parenting and how we need to parent right now in the context of this. And you, and the quote goes, maybe the last job of parenting is surrendering the lead and letting our kids guide us forward. We're going to need the help, which is how I feel right now 
um, when it comes to teaching my son um, anything about uh, being masculine. So like outside of of how to safely catch and release a spider, um, I'm I'm figuring this out. So how do we balance that that idea of being humble and learning and learning with our kids and from our kids, uh, but not abdicating our responsibility as a parent in this because they are kids. Oh yeah. And when I say like, you know, our final job is parents, I don't mean when they're nine or 11 and being like, yeah, you take the lead, dude, you go, you just go. <laughs> this is yours. I uh, hear the keys. <laughs> Here's the, the code. Here's the mortgage buddy. It's on you. Uh, I definitely don't mean at that age, but I do think that the sort of transfer of power happens very gradually um, into their adulthood. And I guess the way to do it, what I'm learning as a parent, and believe me, I don't have all the answers or even most of them, um, is that the critical skill with parenting is, is listening and hearing your kids. And it starts really early. You know, it starts when we have a kid and we subconsciously want that kid to be a certain person, whether it's just reflecting our own values, um, whatever it is, we steer our kids in a certain way. We can't help it. We're parents. That's what we do. But what I have found, and I think every parent finds, is that your kids will tell you who they are and they will tell you what they need and they will tell you where they want to go. And it's incumbent upon us to listen and to at times let them lead. It doesn't mean we let them lead us to the amusement park instead of going to school, which is what my kids would have liked most of the time. But it means on a more fundamental level, I think like kind of just listening to what they're telling us about who they are. Um, it's not always easy to do, I think, because uh, this, what they want conflicts with who we want them to be. Oh, if for sure. And also their kids, like they don't know what they want. I'm 42. I don't know what I want. Like there is some aspect of that exploration that is finding that balance between guiding mm -hmm. um, and parenting and allowing them to explore on their own. It It does oftentimes occur to me as like, teaching them how to ride the bike. Like there's like core concepts that I want my son to walk away with from my time with him. Uh, kindness, empathy, um, a sense of, of uh, purpose in the world. But those are also things I don't necessarily have control over. They, it, like he has to drive those. Um, and then the other things um, that surround that, well, that's, that's for him to steer the bike into. Um, uh, I tortured the heck out of that metaphor. So um, uh, <laughs> I, I like, I'm, um, I'm glad. Uh, that's right. And I'm not, I'm not, look, I'm not, uh, I'm not ad, uh, uh, advocating like a kind of touchy feely, you lead the way parenting. Um, I, I think I'm saying, I think you said. Welcome to free ranging your children with Michael Ian Black. Yeah, that's not me. Like I had like a firm hand in my kids upbringing, but um, I also, understood very quickly that they were only going to be led so far. Like they are their own people from, you know, the moment go. And it's important to have that dialogue with them. Uh, a, a couple more questions before we um, invite some audience Q&A. So if you have questions, put them in the YouTube chat or put them in the Facebook, uh, Facebook comments. Um, you touch on... Um, uh, religiosity and spirituality in the context of masculinity. Um, and I'm so curious about this because um, I grew up in a Hindu household, which has a slightly different definition of masculinity than, than some other religions. It's less. What, what, uh, what's the, what, what would you say is the difference? Well, I mean, just from a uh, outset, it's less conquer the infidels um, uh, <laughs> than, uh, than other religions, but also there is um uh, there is still like a streak of of patriarchy that dominates mm. um, the stories and the and the fables and you know uh, emphasizes the protect and provide. Um, but it's also where we get things like um, arranged marriages and dowries mm. and um, the relationship men have to to women and subserviency. So yeah, don't get me wrong, I'm not painting Hinduism as a as a necessarily like a, a pure vir virtuous thing when it comes to masculinity in modern context. I just think it's different. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I'm curious what you you reflect up, upon this later in the book about masculinity and spirituality and religion. How how did that occur for you? And then how did you uh, when you were growing up? And how did that translate to your son, which was you know you had a you're an atheist, you're a known atheist. Like I'm an atheist myself. Um, how did that sort of shift uh, change your perspective on it? I grew up. Uh, fairly irreligious in a Jewish household, an irreligious Jewish household, uh, which is not a contradiction in terms, it's pretty common. Um, so I didn't grow up with religion, although I really felt like I grew up with an understanding of the culture of Judaism. Um, and always felt kind of deeply Jewish. I ended up marrying a Catholic woman who is a person of faith. Um, and I felt unsettled by her wanting to raise the kids in the Catholic tradition. I was never fully comfortable with it, um, but didn't strenuously object because I, I felt like it was more, it was more important to her that they have some religious uh, training than it was uh, difficult for me. So, you know, it was like, this is more important to you than to me. So they did. Um, neither of them came out of it particularly religious, but as I got older, um, I acknowledged and continue to acknowledge that we all have deep spiritual needs, that those needs have to be met in some way that there is part of us as humans, I don't know why, that seeks something ineffable from the world and we spend our lives trying to make some peace with, with that question. And so I, my advice to my son is, I don't know what religion, if any, you're going to end up being, but don't ignore that yearning that you're gonna have because everybody has it. Um, you're gonna have to address it for yourself. And that that should be like an exciting thing and a, and a, and a fun might be the wrong word, but, but um, it, can, it, can, it can provide a lot of like lines of inquiry that can be really rewarding for you, but, but do it, don't ignore it and use religion, whatever religion you settle on, if you settle on religion as a tool um, all it is, is it's giving you, you know, some help to, to, to find those questions, but it, but in and of itself, it is not the solution. It's just a structure. Uh, I'm curious how writing this for your son has impacted your relationship, if at all, with your daughter. Uh Oh, that's a uh, too long of a sigh. She's 17 think... mm -hmm. and fully 17. Um, I adore both of my kids very much. I just adore them. Um, and I wouldn't say that the book directly had an impact on my relationship with my daughter, but this specifically, but a lot of what I've been going through in writing the book has, I think, made me more, uh, conscious of my relationship with both of them in, in general and the way I try to deal with them and speak with them and listen to them. Um, I, I, I think I've gotten better at listening since I started writing this book. And sometimes the message is dad, get out of my face. And I'm like trying to learn how to respect that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of those conversations are forthcoming. I think, um, uh, we made the choice a long time ago to stop with the one child uh, mm -hmm. so that we constantly outnumber him. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and that's proven effective, but I also um, find myself in recent times um, sort of uh, missing the experience of what that would have been um, with a, another sibling or um, a, a daughter, um, because I feel like I, I've garnered um, so much from uh, parenting my son um, from for myself, not just not not for him. Oh yeah, no. Parenting should always be primarily a selfish act. Don't misunderstand me. It's primarily and should be about what you get out of it. Yes, I, I mean, wait. I, 
<laughs> I thought that's what this isn't this well, like that's the message of the book. The message yeah. of the book is you get a book advance when you have a kid. Like Did that's I, cool. I I must have completely misunderstood the book. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm so sorry to our audience today. Um, uh, before we turn over to audience questions, uh, has your son read it? Do you want him to read it? He has started reading it. It was sitting on his nightstand table for about four months. I like the idea that he starts reading and he's like, boring. And it's like kind of tough. That's basically been his reaction at this point. Um, he doesn't love it. And I think, you know, he's like, it's not you, you know, it's, it's like, it's like your writer voice. It's not the way you talk to me. And that's true to a certain extent. But I also think it's probably difficult for a 19 year old to like read a very, kind of vulnerable book from his dad. I think that's probably not that easy to do. So, you know, he has agreed that it will be one of the first books he reads after I die. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to some audience questions. So Lynn asks, what are some portrayals of masculinity in our culture that you like? Um, do you think comedy can actually be a good platform um, to culture or pressure um, uh, some of those other genres? Well, yeah, I mean, comedy can be a great platform for anything. Um, comedy is a very pliable medium uh, as evidenced by my hilarity here tonight. I mean, it's been nothing but a laugh fest here tonight. Uh, you know, co comedians and male comedians, particularly white male comedians have a terrible reputation for the way we speak about women, the way we sometimes treat women. And I think a lot of that is deserved. I mean, you need look no further than, you know, headlines about uh, comedians in the last few months or years, and you'll see evidence of that. But then I think about somebody like uh, Richard Pryor, who was so flawed as a guy um, dealt with addiction, dealt with, you know, all kinds of tr childhood traumas and was able to synthesize all of that into really life affirming comedy. Um, and always seemed like really kind of in touch with who he was and always seemed, I mean, masculine is maybe the wrong word, but he never seemed anything other than masculine, you know, like he wasn't tough but he was like a guy talking the way guys talk, the way people talk. George Carlin, similarly, um, was a very, you know, I think of him as like a humanist more than anything else and was able to talk about complex ideas in a obviously hilarious way, um, in a smart way, in a challenging way, and was a good model of masculinity as far as I'm concerned. The guy that I think about uh, of our contemporaries, the best model, or at least what we know about him, you know, for public consumption. And I, I think we know a lot about him at this point is Barack Obama, who really inhabits a space of a kind of gentle, compassionate, caring, but strong masculinity, a guy who is unafraid to be tough at times in public, but isn't afraid to break into amazing grace, you know, when, yeah moment is right. Um, you know, I hesitate to elevate anybody too highly because we are all flawed. We all have our foibles. We are all annoying. Um, but, you know, certainly the public image of Barack Obama is as good a model of masculinity, contemporary masculinity, as I think we have. I will say his, uh, the fact that he is, um, a, a so accomplished and so thoughtful on legal issues, scholarship issues, and then has comedic timing is kind of <laughs> irritating uh, to me personally. Yeah, but you know what? One thing I've learned about presidents is like, they always get the laugh, you know? Cause it's, you know, it's like they get the benefit of the room. It's like, you're the president, people laugh at your jokes. You just do. I mean, the, the really the only exception to that rule that I have ever known is Donald Trump, who is tremendously unfunny, um, like actively unfunny. That speaks to a whole other thing, which there's no reason to get into. But everybody, every other president, I feel like, like George W. Bush got laughs. You know, he had his big laugh line was, uh, you know, I'm standing here before you to prove that even 
uh, a C student can become president, something like that, uh, which I actually quote in the book. Um, big laugh. No? Uh, l- let's keep on the topic of comedy. And my friend Matt specifically says this question's from Michael Ian Black. Thank you, Matt. Uh, <laughs> are there any sketches or comedy routines from your past that you wouldn't want to watch, uh, wouldn't want your children to watch? Uh, well... <laughs> Yeah, I get. I mean, not now that they're older. No, not really. But like when I was doing a nightclub show in New York for years called Stella, with my friends Michael Showalter and David Wayne, and uh, it was like a nightclub show. And every week we would make a short comedic video to show at the show, and those featured a lot of dildo work, just a, like a tremendous amount of dildo work. Um, because it's like you buy the dildo and then you have to amortize the cost over the, the, the number of videos sure. that you're doing. So just for, you know, at a certain point, the dildo pays for itself, but it takes a while. So the dildo showed up in a lot of those videos. When they were kids, I would say those videos in particular, I wouldn't show them. But now if they want, if they want to watch me sucking off Mrs. Claus, they are welcome to. Have they seen much of your, your old stuff? Do they show an uh, interest some- in that? Some, they don't display a tremendous amount of curiosity about it. And honestly, I'm fine with it. Like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, all I want to be is their dad. Like, I don't give a shit if they, if they watch Mm -hmm. my old TV shows or anything. I don't care. Uh, can I ask just on that front, on the comedy front, uh, you've done some recent things that sort of are revisits to uh, either characters or shows that you've done uh, in the past. There's the, the Wit Hot American Summer um, reunion show there. You've, you've done some reunion stuff with members of the state. Um, is that something that you are, are still actively thinking about? Or is this, uh, are you entering kind of a new phase? Because from what I'm reading in this book, it, it feels like a, a different phase of your of your comedy seems to be coming through. Well, y- yes and no. I mean, you know, the book, as I say, you know, it's a mostly serious book, but that doesn't erase like the fact that I love silly shit. I do and always will. I love absurdity and surrealism and I love deadpan humor. I haven't abandoned it. Um, it's just not all of who I am. So no, I like it's, you know, I do stand up. I, you know, I'm, I'm always sort of playing around with different tones, not because like I'm trying to reinvent myself every five minutes, but just because I feel like just as people, like we speak, we do different things at different times and it's just, I I can't just do one thing. And again, like, I wish I could, because it would be better for me professionally if I could just be the absurdist weirdo or the deadpan asshole or the sincere dad. Like, if I could just be one of those things, it would be great, but that's just not who I am. Like, I'm a full spectrum human, full spectrum human being, and I want to be able to do full spectrum stuff. Uh, so Jeremy asked a question like we're growing our kids are growing up in a time of of social media that didn't exist for us and is there a performative nature of that social media that's exacerbated the pressure for both boys and go- girls in comparison to to when we were younger yes thanks Jeremy great question <laughs> well yeah I mean I, I worry about it most acutely with my daughter and with young girls who you know, I think are even more maybe image conscious and body conscious than my generation was. I mean, I think we see some sort of pushback. We're seeing some indications from like commercials and television shows that you don't have to be one body type or one skin tone or one anything. Like we're seeing that. But, you know, if I look at my daughter's social media, like, you know, it's it's a lot about kind of aspirational an aspirational life um, that includes everything from, you know, going to the beach and having a beach body. And, you know, it, 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 yes, I worry about it a lot in particular with my daughter. Do you think they have a healthier relationship to it uh, than we do in media? some sets? Yeah. Yes. If only because they grew up with it. And, you know, I think kids are pretty plastic, you know, they're pretty adaptable. And uh, I think they're coming of age at a time where this is their language. So I think hopefully they have a better, they have a, a more innate understanding of it and hopefully a better relationship with it. 
Uh, Mark asks, regarding police brutality, so get ready for a laugher here. Uh, what do you think is the, of the root cause of so many police officers, which who are oftentimes white men, who commit acts of violence towards people of color? Where does this hate and anger come from? Okay, so I would absolutely defer on answering that question with any sort of authoritative voice. I'm not, I'm not a historian. I don't know the history of policing in this country other than you know, this sort of sketchy stuff, that, not sketchy in the sense of untrustable, but sketchy in my own understanding of it, um, is that the police force arose out of, you know, catching slaves. And, and um, the history, you know, I think what we see in the police force is an exaggeration of what we see in the culture uh, more broadly. The culture is, continues to be, um, a white patriarchy. Um, and in this country, that means a white supremacist patriarchy. I hesitate to go too far into that on this call because, or on this conversation, because I think it's a much deeper issue than I'm capable of speaking about. And I wouldn't want to speak for anybody else, but I do believe that that is the case. I think the history is irrefutable. Yeah, um, this has not been a bowl of laughs. It wasn't intended to be, but uh, <laughs> are, is there something that's helping you get through this insane year? Is sure. there something that's making you laugh? Is there something that you're finding joy in? Um, well, I mean, I'm tremendously lucky. I mean, I have a family that you know, I we see, heard you. You live in Connecticut. We get it. You're, you're pretty, you're pretty wild lucky. of Connecticut. Well, you know, Connecticut had a terrible time of it for a little while, but I live in the woods and, you know, pre-COVID, our biggest worry was Lyme disease. It remains a concern. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm lucky. I have a family. I'm not destitute. You know, although my industry is shut down, I had some savings. I've been able to live off of those. Um, I have creative outlets. I have projects that keep me busy. Um, I have very funny friends. Um, you know, I'm incredibly fortunate and I, I know that and, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for it. Is there content that you've gravitated towards, um, during this year that's really kind of stuck out to you? Not really. I mean, my tastes haven't really changed as a result of the, the crises that we're facing. I mean, I read, I read a lot of spy books, but I always have. Um, I watch a lot of documentaries, but I always have. I've been playing piano, uh, which has been keeping me busy. I took a Bible class, which has kept me busy. I didn't know anything about the Bible. You know, like I'm doing things, and, but my tastes, I think, are pretty, pretty much my tastes. Wow. I would like none of those things would have been on my like list of, of what I would expect Michael Ian Black to say that like he was uh, uh, recommending during, during the pandemic. The new thing um, is hiking and backpacking and camping. That's brand really? new. That's in the uh, last few weeks. And why last is that? Month. Because my stupid friend, Matt made me watch this show. I have called... a stupid friend, Matt. He's in the chat. So yeah, okay. I get this. Like they... maybe the same guy. Yeah. Yeah, it made me be. watch the show called Alone, which I guess is in its seventh season. I'd never seen it. It's a reality show where they drop people off in the Arctic Circle and they have to fend for themselves, by themselves. You know, there's like 10 contestants, but they're all isolated from each other. And I got hooked on this show. And like by episode four or five, after going, these people are insane. Me going, I kind of want to do that. So I bought like a tent and a sleeping bag. And I went out on my first solo hiking trip, uh, a week and a half ago on the Appalachian Trail, I was gone for three and a half days camping and hiking and suffering. And I'm going to go back out probably next week. Oh, that's amazing. And do you find the solitude actually kind of fits been, the moment? Look, I just told you how blessed I am to be with my family. I don't need to be with them anymore. It's enough. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> I'm going to say that um, uh, a little quieter. I agree pretty deeply Wait, um, how do you know my family That's so no weird. no i'm just, i think my family is listening at the door i think they're pretty uh i, I think I'm, I'm done with it too um i just want to uh, uh close i have one more question to close but before that i, I just want to say that you know reading this book it reminded me of of the importance of saying 
I love you to my son. And I, I've done that more, more times than I count, certainly more times than I remember hearing it growing up. Um, but I've never said what you close the book with, which is thank you for being my son. And there is something just really beautiful about that, um, that uh, I'm going to wait for the right moment, but I'm definitely feel inspired to say to my son. Uh, we have a tradition here at Inforum um, closing uh, with one question, which is what is your 60 second idea to change the world? I mean, the temptation is to be glib and to say more ice cream. And in fact, I think I'm going to embrace that glibness because in my experience, ice cream really does tend to make everything better. Like there's not a situation that I can think of that ice cream doesn't improve. Uh, I'm really struggling to think of any situation where if somebody presented me with ice cream, I wouldn't welcome it. I'm even thinking like if I were caught in an avalanche and somebody came along and said, do you want some ice cream? Really? So you're freezing cold because you're caught in an avalanche and you'd still go for the ice cream. I think so. Yeah. I think even in that situation, I'd be like, you know, hang out, like absolutely help me dig out in a moment. But, but yes, I will take the ice cream. And what's the go-to flavor for uh, an avalanche buried Michael That's and Black? The beauty about ice cream is that the variety is infinite. Now look, there will be times, many times where all I want is soft serve, soft serve vanilla with chocolate sprinkles, many times. But you give me a uh, uh, chocolate chip cookie dough, great. You give me butter pecan, fabulous. You give me Edie's caramel delight, no problem. Like. They're just, they're, it's hard. You, I'm much harder pressed to think of an ice cream flavor I wouldn't enjoy. I can't Fair. think of one. Fair enough. I think like the the watchers of the stream could see my physical reaction when you said butter pecan and where I lost all respect for Michael Ian Black in in one moment. It's oh, such terrible a good choice. ice cream. It's such a good ice cream. There's, I mean, but but really, like, what's the where's what's the bad ice cream flavor? What is uh, it? I'm not a fan of anything marshmallow related. But you'd eat it. Ice creams. You'd eat it. If, oh, Rocky, eat if somebody it. gave you it's, Rocky Road. It's 2020. It. I'm going to eat anything with sugar and <laughs> calories in it right now. Um, Thank you to Michael Ian Black for joining us today in Forum at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, we'd like to remind our audience that Michael has a new book out called A Better Man, A Mostly Serious Letter to His Son. It's available at your preferred bookseller. I recommend a local bookseller. Uh, if you'd like to see more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming happen, visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Kishore Hari. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Kishore. Thank you, Commonwealth Club. This was great.